Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Iron Africa with me, Georgia Coven Smith. Tonight, there's another day of violence in Abuja. Shia protesters accuse police of having shot dozens. Nigerian, Nigerian security forces, though, say only three died in Monday's clashes. Also, South Sudanese rebels say that their leader, Rik Machar, is heading back to Juba this week to see a peace deal aimed at ending almost five years of civil war. Past agreements haven't lasted long, though, and some South Sudanese remain sceptical. And a new law in Morocco gives domestic workers new contract terms that should help protect them from exploitation. It will hopefully make a particularly big difference to young employees, known as little maids, many of whom have had their childhoods affected by abuse. But first, police fired on Shia Muslim protesters in Abuja on Tuesday as they kept up street protests calling for the release of their leader. Members of the Islamic Movement of Nigeria accused troops of having killed at least 24 people on Monday. The military claims that just three died in clashes. Three more were earlier killed in similar circumstances on Saturday. The IMN want Ibrahim Zakzaki freed. He's been in jail since 2015 when security forces killed hundreds in a crackdown on the group. It accuses Sunni majority authorities of persecution. Sam Olakoya tells us more. Well, uh, there had been a long-standing problem between the Nigerian military and the IMN. It dates back several years. Whenever the Islamic movement goes out on their yearly uh, procession, the military often come out to disrupt the uh, procession. And uh, in 2015, uh, the, it culminated into a major uh, clash that led to the killing of hundreds of uh, IMA members. Now, since then, the military has become very, very hard on them. And this year, again, we are seeing something almost uh, similar to what happened in 2015. Why the military should always come out to disrupt their procession is very unclear. I mean, traditionally, it is the police that that is responsible for this type of work. But often when the IMA uh, go out on, on their procession, it is the military that will normally be sent out to acquire the, the procession. Sam Olakoya there for us. Now, South Sudanese rebels say that their leader will be heading back to the capital this week in order to seal a peace deal aimed at ending almost five years of brutal civil war. Rik Machar fled Juba two years ago after the collapse of an earlier agreement. He's supposed to join President Salva Kiir on Wednesday. Some South Sudanese, though, aren't particularly hopeful as several past accords have not held up very long. Take a look. Alfonso Albino is a member of Salam Janoub. It's an NGO that promotes peace amongst communities. South Sudan has been racked by a civil war these last five years. But on Wednesday, President Salva Kiir and rebel leader Riek Machar are due to attend a peace ceremony in Juba. They signed a deal last month in Addis Ababa. Alfonso is looking for a nice shirt to wear during the celebrations, but he remains wary. Many peace deals have failed in recent years. He says tensions remain high in the country. People are stranded in Juba. You go outside, you'll find yourself dead. Because in the booth, these people are hostile, even the, the local communities. They are not rebel, they are not what, but they are just dangerous. When you go there and you look, you look very strange, somebody from the town, why are you here? Then you'll find yourself killed. Others are more hopeful. This is a day where South Sudanese can come together, you know, gather around and reflect, you know, on you know, on why peace is so precious to all of us, especially with our background of the war, you know, and we need to start talking and to cultivate a culture of peace. Riek Machar fled the country two years ago and has not returned since. The civil war has killed an estimated 380,000 people and displaced 4 million South Sudanese, a third of the entire population. It is one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. In South Africa, at least seven people have been killed by raging wildfires at a farming settlement along the famous Garden Route. The blazes started last week along the Southern Tourist Trail. A baby and a pregnant woman are reportedly amongst those who died after having been trapped in Farley. Around 400 firefighters have been trying to subdue the flames. 
In Ghana, a former FIFA council member has been banned from football for life over being filmed, accepting $65,000 worth of bribes from undercover reporters. Kwezi Nantyaki was found guilty by FIFA's ethics committee of bribery. He had been the senior vice president of the Confederation of African Football and president of Ghana's Soccer Federation when the footage was revealed back in May. An African conservationist have slammed China's easing of a 25-year ban on trading tiger bones and rhino horns, saying that it's a death warrant for endangered species. The State Council unexpectedly announced on Monday that the products would be allowed to be sold under special circumstances. Wildlife campaigners fear the new rules could increase the chances of poaching. Africa's rhino populations have already been decimated by black market demand. Now, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has called for more international companies to invest in Africa. Speaking at Berlin at the opening of a summit aimed at attracting more private finance to the continent, Merkel spoke of the need for fairer relations with Africa and of its huge potential. Germany is planning on investing in healthcare, agriculture and education, and Merkel said that the continent's fortunes are tied to those of Europe's. Why is Africa so important for us? It is important because we are neighbours. If you look at the world map, and that is why it is in our interest that it goes well in the whole African continent, not only in Europe. Africa is in some aspects a very rich continent when it comes to resources, but also when it comes to what Europe lacks. And that is youth. In Morocco, law 1912 to protect domestic workers has come into force after more than 12 years of debate. It means changes to staff contracts, which should mean all of them get access to social protection. The change also marks a huge step forward in efforts to tackle the exploitation of household employees, particularly children. Our correspondents report. Since I was seven, I've been living in homes all my life, cleaning until I was 23 years old. I was so badly treated, I contemplated suicide. Hanam was eventually saved by an organization fighting child labor, but her distress is still visible today. A distress shared by an estimated 60 to 80,000 minors exploited as domestic staff in Morocco. 16 to 18 year olds can be legally employed for five years, but child labor is now banned under a new law. NGOs are pushing for it to be applied in full. Our campaign is simple. The message is be afraid. Be afraid of this law, be afraid of prison, and release these little girls. Faced with civil society sending out the message on its own, the authorities are preparing to give out more information on the law, which says all house workers must be declared. The proper application and implementation of this law is very important. We're dealing with the issue of training and awareness. People must know that there's a law that needs to be respected. An awareness that doesn't seem to have reached those concerned. That's the case for Zayad, ready to pay the 25% social charges and declare his cleaning lady who works here twice a week. But for him, the law doesn't work for every situation. If someone has several employers, then who will have to declare them? Is it the one they're at most of the time? Or will everyone have to make a separate statement? Or will everyone have a separate contract? It's a bit complicated. 48 hours of work a week, a minimum wage and a weekly day off. Measures that are difficult to control on a day-to-day -day basis. And not everyone is up to speed. No, we don't know anything about it. We just heard they were going to make a law for domestic workers with contracts. But we don't know the details. Nobody is going to apply it. It will be rare. This new legislation could benefit hundreds of thousands of people, but for now employers and employees alike seem lost in the necessary administrative procedures. That's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care. You might watch France 24 in English, but don't forget, France 24 is also broadcast in French, Arabic, and Spanish. Available on cable and satellite systems and online media in France and around the world. 
Idi Amin Dada, Uganda's despotic leader, presided over his country in the 70s. He is remembered in very different ways. Some recall the hundreds of thousands who were killed and tortured. However, those who were born after that horrific era laud his lesser-known accomplishments. For them, he was as a builder, a nationalist, and a separatist, the leader of time in Uganda's history, which they regard as a bygone golden era. We revisit the Kampala of Idi Amin Dada here on France 24.